And then another person commented and said, sometimes I see it's not gaslighting at all. It's just an argument and petty comebacks, which are necessary at times. And perhaps we or they are tired or stressed. I think of gaslighting as someone avoiding a straight answer, turning things on the opposite. So basically describing the therapeutic definition of that, right? Not every argument is gaslighting. Hi, and welcome to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast, episode number 108. So today on the podcast, I wanted to talk about a topic that kind of got, I've had a soapbox about it for a while, but I shared it on social media and it resonated with a lot of people, especially in the mom groups that I'm in. And so I thought that I should do a full podcast episode just to kind of explore this with you and share my thoughts about it. That is the topic of misusing therapy speak. So I have just noticed that over maybe the last three years, some of this jargon, this therapy jargon has become a little more more mainstream. I appreciate the fact that like we're all learning like different, you know, words and descriptors for certain maybe situations that we experience that maybe we didn't have like adequate language for. But some time back, I was having a conversation with my husband and I told him that I thought he was gaslighting me. And he was like, what does that even mean? And I was like, well, you're making me think that I don't know what I'm saying. And so, again, that is not really the meaning of gaslighting. We'll get to it in a second. But probably a month later, my husband then has a similar situation in which I'm being defensive on something he was complaining about. And he was like, oh, well, you're gaslighting me. And of course, I was like, oh, touche. So... What I wanted to talk about is how this thing has, you know, gotten prevalence that, you know, using therapy lingo can actually be harmful in several ways. But what I want to talk about is some examples of some terms that even I myself have misused in the past, but maybe that we can explore them because what I want you to understand from this is that There are descriptors for people with these issues, but I think what we've started to do as a culture is pathologize like behavior. So one example is, like I said, gaslighting. Gaslighting in therapy speak is used to specifically refer to a pattern of behavior where one person intentionally makes another person doubt their own perception or memories. And what happens when we use it, we misuse it, is that we often use it to describe behavior that is manipulative or deceptive. If we misuse it, right, we can be trivializing the experience for those who have actually experienced true true gaslighting, and it actually makes it harder for them to be taken seriously. Another word that I think has been misused very much in our culture is triggered. So in therapy... A trigger is something that causes a strong emotional reaction due to past trauma or negative experience. But in casual culture, how we misuse this word is to casually describe feeling upset or angry or slighted. And so when we do that, right, there are people who might actually struggle with triggers and that makes it harder for them to find language to actually describe the actual triggers that they have. The other one that I think is important to talk about is using the descriptor of toxic and the therapeutic use of this word refers to a pattern of behavior that is consistently damaging and unhealthy. But in common, like in, in, I guess in pop culture, we have misused this word to describe behaviors or situations that are negative or harmful, right? And so it kind of blurs the line for people between what is truly toxic behavior and it may actually trivialize the experience of those who are in toxic, like actual toxic behavior. The other one that I kind of like, I'm 50-50 on, but I found this as a good explanation and I know that I use this term, is self-care. And... You know, I think as a culture, we kind of do understand what self-care means, but the original connotation of self-care was to 
in reference to actions or activities that promote mental and emotional well-being. Now, in pop culture, we do use it to describe any activity, any, meaning any activity that promotes self-compassion or, or relaxation. I just kind of wanted to just put that in your minds as we talk about it. Hey, Mama, you deserve a life free of overwhelm and burnout. Welcome to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast. I'm your host, life and mindset coach, Shiro Bergbauer. I'm also a wife, mom, and CRNA. This is the podcast for high achieving mamas in medicine like you and I. Together, we'll learn how to navigate the ups and downs of working motherhood. If you're looking to thrive in your relationships and overcome overwhelm in your motherhood, marriage, and medicine, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast. Now, these are some broader ones that I think also get misused and kind of, again, get blurred. And the five that I want to talk about are trauma, codependency, boundaries, enabler, and recovery. And again, here's the thing. I share this because I have also been guilty of misusing some of these terms. And by no means am I criticizing anybody that like has used these terms to actually describe something that f- other than what they're for. But I think it's important that we bring our awareness to some of these often misused or mislabeled things because then we can actually start to like label behaviors, behaviors. So one of the things I want you to think about is like when we mislabel or pathologize behavior. So like if somebody is being unkind or just acting in a manner that we don't like, it doesn't mean they're toxic Or another one that I think is interesting to think about is when we are maybe saying somebody is bullying us versus like they're just being unkind. So like then we label the person as a bully or as a toxic person. And I think we should be having these conversations because one of the things that came up in in one of the posts that I shared about this topic was that Parents of teens are noticing more of the use of therapy speak in their teen children to describe certain emotional states. So for example, anxiety has been very much been misused. ADHD has been very much misused. And so I think it's important that we have this ground awareness of like, what do we, what is actually the meaning of the things that we're saying? So when I was younger, and this is a little bit of a tangent, when I was younger, I worked in an assisted living facility. And I had, we had two residents in this facility that suffered from clinically diagnosed obsessive compulsive disorder. When I experienced this, I had just like, again, I was young. I was not even familiar with the OCD or what it was. And every time in my profession, somebody says, I'm so OCD, it takes me back to those two residents in the assisted living. One of them had this like obsession with time. And so she would do things at a very specific time intervals. And she also had obsessive compulsive cleaning behaviors, like washing her hands over and over. In fact, she would literally wash her hands so many times a day, she would have sores in her hands. The other person had this like bathroom obsessive compulsive behavior where he went to the bathroom every certain time frame. And I forget, it was like minutes. Like, let's say we could say it was like, it was not an hour. It was like 55 minutes. And it didn't matter what he was doing in that moment. Like when it started to get to 50 minutes, he would literally go to the bathroom. He would cut his toilet paper pieces in very specific like numbers, like boxes on the toilet paper. And so when I've been in nursing and in anesthesia, I hear this used a lot where somebody's like, I'm so OCD and I like my things a certain way. And I get the intention of what they're saying, but it kind of like irks me a little bit because I'm like, you are not OCD. (laughs) Like you're just like picky and specific and maybe anal retentive, but you are, you don't have OCD. Like that is a clinical diagnosis. So let's get into these therapy terms. So one is trauma, right? And in this podcast, I usually will, you know, reference like uppercase T trauma or lowercase T trauma. And, you know, trauma is like too much too soon kind of thing. 
And so in therapy, it's used to specifically refer to an event or a series of events that cause significant emotional distress and have long lasting effects on one's mental and emotional well-being. So, but sometimes we misuse the word trauma to describe any negative experience. So we are like, it was traumatizing for me, or I am traumatized and I have this trauma, not to trivialize like that anything can have impact on your, on your long-term mental health. It's just to aware, like have awareness of what that actually means. The second one, which is codependency, right, is used in therapy to describe a pattern of behavior where one person relies on another person for their own emotional well-being to an unhealthy degree. And when sometimes we use misuse it in, in pop culture, we're usually just using it to describe close relationships. So again, tuning back into what the, that, what does it even mean? Now, boundaries is a big one for me because I talk about boundaries a lot on this podcast. I coach my clients a lot on boundaries. But in the real therapeutic use of the term boundary is to have ways in which we communicate our needs and limits in a relationship. But in pop culture, we may misuse it to describe any kind of limit or restriction. So what I have been thinking about lately, and I forget where I read about this, but I think pop culture has kind of created this like parallel between like boundaries mean cutting people off or boundaries mean like never speaking to people and I think what's happening is that very like unkind behaviors are being done under the guise of oh I'm just enforcing my boundaries like these are my boundaries and communication is lacking so if you are saying that you know you're creating a boundary but you're not communicating the boundary right it's actually not a boundary. You are literally just cutting people off, right? And so let's create more awareness of like what boundaries are and what boundaries are not because cutting people off isn't really a boundary. Like like limiting contact with somebody after you've communicated a need and limits in your relationship and they continue to erode that need or limit, that's different from just like, I'm not speaking to this person anymore because they are not doing what I want them to do or I'm mad at them. This is an emotional boundary. Now, enabler is used for a person who enables another person's harmful behavior. But in pop culture, sometimes we use it to describe any supportive behavior, right? So just like, oh, like I'm enabling this person to do this thing. And we start using it in pop culture to kind of, again, blur some lines there and I think it's important that we discuss that. Now, recovery in therapy is used to the process of overcoming addiction or other mental health challenges. But in pop culture, we may misuse this term to describe any process of healing or growth. And before I get on to like, what is, what are the dangers of this misuse of of therapy speak? I do want to say that I think we have to start like calling behavior what it is and not like throwing these blanket terms to make it sound more serious or more intense than it is. Like, so like for me, when I think about criticism, which usually will lead to defensiveness, calling that gaslighting is really undervaluing the importance of communication in a relationship and what are the consequences of defensive behavior. The other thing that I've started to think about is when we are affiliating this, this this behavior to other people, are we then self-reflecting? Are we looking at ourselves in the mirror and seeing our own negative behaviors, our own behaviors that maybe are we should be reflecting on instead of like giving titles to other people's behavior? So recently I was reading a post in a group and the individual had asked something, a question about like, what should I do? My husband was being very mean yesterday and he was like, when I brought it to his attention, he was like, it wasn't even that serious. And what I noticed is that the feedback to this person was like, he is totally gaslighting you and he is totally a narcissist. And my thought was, well, let me ask a little more question because maybe this is an acute thing. This is not a chronic thing. And honestly, the way that post was worded, it very much seemed like an acute thing. And so what I offered this poster was, if it is a cue, like, can we maybe have the conversation with our partner about how that behavior, like, felt? So, like, I felt disrespected or I felt disregarded when you said these words. So using a soft and startup, which is like, we're criticizing the behavior 
or complaining about the behavior, but we're not criticizing the individual because we don't know the other side of the story. And again, I'm not trying to like put blame on the person who posted it, but we don't know what was happening on from the husband's perspective that he then was defensive and him being defensive is a natural consequence of when we feel criticized and when we feel like we're being accused of something our first response is to be defensive that's like human nature so instead of like giving it a name or like giving it a title maybe choosing curiosity and choosing to ask in-depth questions to understand what is happening with the behavior so what are the dangers of misusing therapy lingo. So some of the dangers can create is how using these terms can create confusion and miscommunication, right? And perpetuate harmful stereotypes and trivialize serious mental health issues. And we'll also maybe talk about like how sometimes misusing this uh, lingo creates power dynamics and can prevent people from feeling, you know, that we hear them and we understand them. Now, What I want to remind you is like these terms, right, they were designed in the therapeutic realm, psychotherapeutic realm to create a shared understanding amongst mental health professionals and clients so that they can have effective communication and treatment. So it is important that this language be used again in the correct context to convey specific meanings and nuances that maybe are difficult to communicate using everyday language. So for example, the term trauma, right? It's again, a series of events or an event that causes significant emotional distress and has long lasting effects on a person's mental and emotional well-being. So when we use this term accurately and responsible, then we we can convey the seriousness of the experience and the need for that person to receive adequate treatment. Now, When we misuse this, right, and have confusion and miscommunication, then like, for example, if a client or an individual is using the term triggered to describe feeling upset or angry without understanding its specific meaning, it can make it difficult for the mental health professional to understand what the actual underlying issue is, right? And think about like when we misuse these terms, and we can perpetuate harmful stereotypes, right? That just increases the stigma surrounding mental health. So for example, if we are using the term toxic to describe any negative behavior, we can trivialize the experience for those who have experienced truly toxic behavior, or even like the term like narcissist, right? When we are using it to describe somebody who is maybe not self-reflecting, for people who have truly experienced narcissism, that can be very invalidating and can also trivialize their exception, their, their experiences. So how do we use this, this language more responsibly and what can we do? I think the first thing is to like acknowledge that we are all like apt to use these terms because again, they're, they're getting, gaining popularity and it just feels like, oh, that's what everybody describes this certain aspect of behavior as, right? Like this is what happens when maybe, I am doing something and I just want to explain it to somebody so that they get it. But doing that, again, remembering that, what is the consequence of that? What is the consequence of us like creating that like acceptable way of describing something that it isn't really what it is? So the other one that I was thinking is um, Somebody commented on this, on on the post that I said, and she said, like, if a lady goes out on a date that doesn't pan out well, it doesn't make the guy a narcissist or toxic, right? A lot of the time, it's just a personality mismatch. And the concept even of red flags, like we're like red flag, red flag, but we too can be the red flag. Like it's not always the other person that's a red flag. So awareness of our own behavior, how we're showing up in the world and how we are like throwing labels, right? Like to just kind of take a step back and self-reflect and say, okay, what are some of the behaviors that maybe have toxic tendencies? Like not describing yourself as a toxic person, but what about this behavior can I just reflect on? Even for the people who commented on my post that had experienced true narcissistic behavior, one of the things that came up was that the the people who had experienced true narcissist behavior had, you know, shared that like they felt they felt like when they were informed, um, 
of of what a true narcissist is like they learned that it was not a common like thing it wasn't it wasn't like oh 99% of people who have this person like this characteristics are narcissists in fact what they were surprised to find out was the that it had a lot to do with frequency and intensity and like you can't just po- like you can't just like you know position that oh like this one thing happened there for the person as a narcissist like there was a very clear like designation of like if you're in a relationship or familiar with somebody who is in a relationship with a true narcissist like they are very behaviors and and the person actually said the true pathological narcissist is a nightmare right and truly we always like defend ourselves and then cause other people to question like their point of view but that's not gaslighting and The other one that I thought I should share this comment was that this lady commented and said, as a mom of a teen and a mom who has lots of teens hanging out at her house all the time, I can confidently say that the next generation has picked up on this and big time. I've heard so many quote unquote therapy terms thrown around and a lot of kids are quick to refer to their self-diagnosis almost as personal technicality traits or causes of their behavior. So this is a constant conversation we're having in our home and it's important that we take responsibility for our own behavior and seek counseling when desired, but not basing your entire personality around labels. So, and she said, the first step for me was identifying and coming to terms with my own behaviors. And that was like such a interesting self-reflection and so profound that look at your own behavior, right? And then another person commented and said, sometimes I see it's not gaslighting at all. It's just an argument and petty comebacks, which are necessary at times. And perhaps we or they are tired or stressed. I think of gaslighting as someone avoiding a straight answer, turning things on the opposite. So basically describing the therapeutic definition of that, right? Not every argument is gaslighting. And another person commented and said, it all starts with looking into ourselves and you know, I'm often thinking, how can I be better? That comes with wisdom and maturity, and hopefully my partner will be doing the same. This person said, one of my favorite things to say is that we've all done stupid things we would rather people didn't know about, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't, we, we don't have to pathologize this behavior. Even just like the normalized, like I am having some anxiety about an upcoming event, or I am afraid of something, doesn't mean we have an anxiety disorder, right? Like, making a point of describing behavior and not misusing these terms, I think will create a culture in which people take ownership for what's happening in their lives and not constantly self-diagnosing to like, oh, this is, this is truly this, this mental health like issue. And technically it's not right. So going back again, you know, when we describe a, a personality issue, poor poor personal behavior versus an actual mental health issue, right? It's looking at the rate, the intensity and frequency that can make that is what really makes it a pathology. And I know like this, when I actually even created the post, I said, you know, this might be upsetting for somebody and it might not sit well with you. And so just take what you need, right? And leave behind what you don't. So if you're not a person who misuses these terms, right? But you've maybe found yourself calling somebody a gaslighter or a narcissist, take what you will. Like just reflect on how else can I define this behavior instead of using a therapy lingo to describe it? Like how can I take ownership of how I'm using these words and what is the lasting impact for the person who is on the receiving end of these words? When I posted about it, I was really trying to like come from a place of like awareness and it was interesting to me that it struck a chord with so many of you and so I was like I need to do an episode on it because I'm sure I'm not the only one that's feeling this way and thinking this way but also kind of give you some some actionable ways of like looking at how not to do it like this is how to do better right (laughs) This is how we could do better as individuals and we can take responsibility. So the last thing that I wanted to just give you is some actionable steps to like ensure that you are not misusing therapy lingo and that you have better awareness of it. So the first one is educate yourself, right? And this is part of the reason I did this podcast to kind of like help 
maybe define some of these commonly misused words for what they really are. So take the time to research the meanings of these commonly used therapy terms and learn how they're used in mental health treatment so that you can then identify whether it's it's an actual descriptor of the behavior that maybe you have concerns about. The second one is asking questions, right? Don't be afraid to ask a mental health professional, such as a licensed therapist, what these terms mean and help you use so they can help you use these terms in a responsible and accurate way. Third is being mindful of your behavior. Pay attention to the way you word things when you talk about behaviors versus mental health concerns. So try to avoid using these terms casually and instead use clear and simple language that actually creates conveys your thoughts and behavior and and feelings about these certain behaviors. Four is practicing empathy, right? Remember that mental health issues can be very complex and very challenging. And so misusing therapy lingo can be harmful to people who are actually struggling. Practice empathy by being mindful of the impact of the language that you use and how it might impact other people and also how it impacts you. Last but not least is if you are in a situation where you are struggling with actual mental health issues, seek professional mental health help. And if you are maybe in a relationship where you look up what a narcissist is and you're like, I think I'm with a narcissist, the best way to figure it out is get the intervention of a licensed mental health professional who can then help you understand whether or not this is true narcissistic behavior and even give you tools to maybe navigate and get yourself out of the situation. So in summary, by educating yourself, asking questions, right, it can help you like have better awareness and not misuse therapy speak lingo and be able to communicate more effectively about mental health issues and also behavioral issues that are concerning to you that you think that could be addressed in in the context of the relationship or even in the context of parenting that could be addressed by just bringing awareness to what they actually mean. So I hope that you've enjoyed this episode and I hope that this gives you some self-reflection insights to maybe be able to navigate these situations. And I know, especially for parents of teens, like Social media has had a big impact on like this misuse of therapy lingo and maybe just helping your teen or, you know, preteens understand what these diagnoses actually mean so that they can have better awareness and not misuse these words um, in a, and, 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 you know, and or use them out of context. So that's all I have for you today. I will speak to you next week. I hope you have a great week and whatever you're doing, remember you are worthy of love and belonging and you matter. Have a great day. I'm Shira Bergbauer, and you've been listening to the Stethoscopes to Swaddles podcast. New episodes are out every Monday. These episodes are created by me, Shira Bergbauer, and produced by Cassidy Mitchell. If you enjoyed this show or found it helpful, please rate it and review us on Apple Podcasts. The concepts I share on this podcast resonate with you or you're ready to change your relationships and mindset, I can help you. If you'd like in-depth, personalized support, I'd love to invite you to apply for my Life and Mindset coaching program. Just imagine you and I every week working together as I teach you the tools to up-level your life. To book your free one-hour consultation call, go to www dot stethoscopes to swaddles dot com forward slash consultation you're doing a great job mama have a great week bye now